This is the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast from Literary Hub, where we believe that every issue in your Twitter feed or on the evening news has already been tackled somewhere in literature. I'm Vivi Ganeshananthan, also known as Sugi, author of the novel Love Marriage. And I'm Whitney Terrell, bro. Wait a minute, that doesn't work. <laughs> the author of the novel Good Lieutenant. Hang on. Why are we using the term bro? Well, I've been waiting three seasons to call you a bro wit. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, this is our modern myth-making episode, and I needed the best word to announce it, so I thought I'd borrow from the already famous opening line of my friend Maria Devana Headley's new translation of Beowulf. Bro, tell me we still know how to speak of kings. In the old days, everyone knew what men were. Brave, bold, glory-bound. Only stories now, but I'll sound the Spear Dane song hoarded for hungry times. Just, do you think, have you read the, been reading the things about how you, you guys should not be used uh, like for multi, for, for all, it shouldn't be used for men and women? You been it reading shouldn't about or that? it should? I've read, there's an article in the Atlantic saying that it shouldn't be used as a, as a gender neutral term. It, it, it should only be used with guys. I wonder if bro is, the, is, is, can bro be gender neutral or is bro only guys? I think bro is guys. Okay. Historically. Now that now we Bro. now that we're going to get a ton of bad of email about that, <laughs> want to get that out there and say whatever stupid thing I could say about that. I want to move on to hungry times, which will be less controversial because these are hungry times that we're living in. And today, we're talking about Beowulf and modern myth making, which we're doing a lot of myth making right now. In my personal opinion, um, a story of this election is already a myth, and since we're taping on Halloween, that election has not even happened yet. Well, I mean, I can't think of anyone better to ride that out with, given the circumstances, than Maria. She's an acclaimed novelist whose most recent book is this Bravura translation, and we're thrilled to have her join us today. Maria Devana Headley is the number one New York Times bestselling author and editor. Her books include the novels The Mere Wife, Magonia, Aerie, Queen of Kings, and the memoir The Year of Yes. With Kat Howard, she is author of The End of the Sentence, and with Neil Gaiman, she is co-editor of Unnatural Creatures. Her short stories have been shortlisted for the Shirley Jackson Nebula and World Fantasy Awards. She was raised with a wolf and a pack of sled dogs in the high desert of rural Idaho and now lives in Brooklyn. Maria, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's great to have you with us. And as you know, uh, like many English majors, I've spent time with other translations of this poem, which was written a thousand years ago and has been assigned probably to every college English major since. Um, but for those who might not be familiar with or remember the poem, could you give us your kind of last minute cram before the exam version of the plot? <laughs> yes, I luckily have done this many times because it's kind of a complicated poem, but the plot isn't very complicated. It's a monster named Grendel attacks a new mead hall, which is like the fanciest, most glorious mead hall where all of these guys who are Danes are partying. and. Grendel cannot stand the noise. He comes in and kills a bunch of people. And he does that every night for 12 years and they don't move. And 12 years into this problem, a guy named Beowulf, who is the hero, quote unquote, of the story, um, learns about this and comes to Denmark to attempt to kill their monster, to save them, and also to prove his own prowess. So he does, he kills the Grendel, he gets big rewards from Hrothgar the king. And then that night, Grendel's mother comes and takes one of the uh, one of the warriors as vengeance, one of the king's best guys. So so Beowulf goes in and he does another killing. He comes into Grendel's mother's house under the water or her hall, whatever it is, it's a hall, um, and kills her. Has a big battle with her. Kills her. Comes up, gets gold, gets rewards. But this is a little bit against the rules of Old English and uh, Anglo-Saxon society, so it's a problem. And then 50 years pass, we jump into the future and a dragon comes to Beowulf's kingdom, which is Gatland, which is like contemporary Sweden. And the dragon is incensed by someone stealing a cup from the dragon's den and the dragon is mad and goes on a big rampage. And Beowulf by then is an old man and he decides to go and fight the dragon alone. He kills the dragon, the dragon kills him, they kill each other. And that's the end Spoiler of the Spoiler alert. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big, bloody, three-battle um, epic poem. It's 3,000 lines of intense battles, but also lots of recaps of events for like a multi-night meat hall audience. Your 2018 novel, The Mere Wife, was uh, also modernized Beowulf and portrayed Grendel's mother 
as a war veteran, Dana Mills, who gives birth to Grendel following her rape. Here, once more, your portrayal of Grendel's mother is a feminist one, and your version underlines the character's humanity rather than making her just a monster. What was it like for you to move from the Dana Mills version of this character to the one from the translation itself? It was a really interesting experience. I had, I'd been working on the novel for several years and I had been inspired in part by the 2016 election and the ways in which um, white women had voted for Trump against their own better understanding of what it is to be a woman in this society, I think. And so I was interested in looking at the women of the Beowulf story and looking at the ways in which neighbors are monsterized in order to keep the same group of people in power over and over again. Um, the Dana Mills character is the Grendel's mother character in that. She's a war veteran, she's a soldier. And I had gone into great, I'd gone to great lengths to really get into her head and see what kind of person would, um, in the story hide from larger society. It's a, it's a story about class, it's a story about race, it's a story about um, ongoing discomfort at both ends of the spectrum. And in the translation, which is really a translation, it's I translated every line of the Beowulf poem. I didn't, um, I didn't go afield, although the style is- <laughs> You didn't cheat is, on the translation? It's I like... didn't cheat. The style is, <laughs> is far afield from what the original would be, but the content is not. Um, so it was a very, it was actually a really interesting experience. The Grendel's mother character is only, her big battle is only about a hundred lines of the 3000. And it is, it's pretty short, it's brutal, and she is really fierce. But that's it's kind of, yeah, I I just, that part, the, the, the prose in that part and the way that you translated it, when she's like, he, she's grabbing onto him and leading him through the hall and you have that sense of all these sea monsters coming around and biting at him and he's looking at the walls and the way it's described is really, Amazing, I thought. It's a pretty amazing sequence in the original. It's like um, Beowulf, you have to remember, is he's about 18 years old. He's just a kid. And Grendel's mother has been the queen of her own domain for 50 years. So she's like Hrothgar. She's an old woman. And she is so ferocious that he almost dies. Like, And he's this major warrior. He's so hardcore. Everyone thinks he is. He can slay 30 guys with one blow, basically. He's like a fairy tale character. But Grendel's mother is his equal. And she only, the only reason he wins is that God shines a light on a sword and helps him. So it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting state of affairs, the story. The story in Mere Wife is very, I departed, but, but in, the, uh, in the poem, it's, it's a battle of equals. It's a, and it's a battle of desperation. It becomes a really desperate, agonized battle for her and she dies, but she dies with honor. And in the original, she dies with honor. She, she is kind of lauded by the poet, even though she's one of the villains of the poem. So as I think about the feminism in your work generally, and then also in this translation specifically, I can't help but think about how the stories of women have played out against our recent stories of so-called kings, would-be kings. Um, you know, that Access Hollywood tape came out um, or I guess was leaked, you know, at this point about four years ago. And yesterday, the thing that was kind of like going viral um, regarding that was that Helen Mirren and Sarah Cooper, are you familiar with the Sarah Cooper kind of lip syncing? Yes. Comedies? Okay, so have you seen the Helen Mirren, Sarah Cooper, Access no. Hollywood version? No, I haven't seen it. So um, my partner played this for me this morning and it's um, Helen Mirren as Billy Bush and Sarah Cooper as Trump basically <laughs> redoing the Access Hollywood tape. Um, and so you can hear, you know, Sarah Cooper repeating this Donald Trump mythologizing himself, talking mm -hmm. about himself as this, this myth of a man who can get away with anything. You know, I'm a star. I can do But are whatever. you going to say the Access Hollywood tape is like Beowulf? I love that idea. <laughs> That's <a> fantastic. <laughs> um, it's possible we're stretching slightly, okay. but, um, you know, in your introduction to this book, which is um, also a huge pleasure to read, you, you talk about reciting lines of Beowulf to yourself while watching the news. Uh, and I was curious to hear you talk a little bit about how the shit-talking masculinity of the heroes of old could help us understand our current so-called leaders. Yeah, it's um, when I first thought of doing this translation, I knew that I was going to use as the first word, which is what, which is a word that is a kind of mystery definition, but the first word of the Beowulf poem, what. And it's, in, it's a sort of like, give me the floor, give me the floor but I always felt like the Beowulf story was such a bro story. It's a story about bragging and about, about saying, my guy did this and I did this and it was amazing and I fucking saw it, I was there. And so the, po the poem 
in this case, I think supports the ongoing growth of masculine mythology. We've been reading this poem for about 200 years in English translation. And it's, even if you don't know the poem, even if you haven't read it, you have heard bits of it because it's incorporated itself into our society. So the ways that we talk about heroes and monsters in our contemporary American society are really similar to the ways that they're talked about in the poem. And that's for a reason. That's because the poem is taught in high school and in um, it's, it's a canonical text. So it's one of the few things that we would be exposed to all of us, uh, you know, it's it's just influential in that regard. So I think about the ways in which we uh, societally talk about masculinity as a heroic trait, and we talk about tradition as a, as a justification and as a heroic justification. We've always done it this way. We've always killed monsters in order to become heroes. So I think about the toxicity of what we have ended up with, which is, uh oh, there aren't any monsters. I guess we'll have to make some monsters really fast. We'll make mm. some monsters out of our neighbors because otherwise we can't achieve peak masculine heroics <laughs> as a normal person in society. Unless you are like actually a warrior and you're, you know, maybe you are, maybe you're, maybe you're a soldier. But if you're not, and even in that case, there are problems consistently, problems with heroics, problems with wrong enemy, problems with not guilty enemy, and you're sent over to do whatever it is. Um, but in our basic like propagandized society, getting a heroic designation on yourself, as Trump has all, always sought to do, he wants to be heroic. Um, and he talks about himself using the language of the hero, which is time honored. <laughs> the language of I can do something more, I am mightier than any other man. I am bigger than any other man. I'm stronger, I'm more, he I'm healthier. I'm impervious to disease. Like all of these are things that actually Beowulf says about himself, as do most of the other heroes who are all liars. In the Odyssey, Odysseus says things like this about himself. And even in the story, you can see that that isn't true. Like that things are happening to him that would be very different from the mythology that he is spouting consistently. But it's, um, yeah, it's a tendency, it's a trope, it's something that has kind of infiltrated our society and our ways of talking about power rather than saying, you know, I'm, I'm not a hero, I'm just kind of an ordinary person, which is actually something that the Democrats consistently try to say. And it's, it's hard. It's hard to use that language and make people feel passionate. But if you use heroic monster defeating language, people feel passionate because they've been trained to feel passionate about that kind of language. So fascinating. And I mean, look, the, the whole idea behind our show is that everything that you see in the news has already been written about in literature. And here you are, you know, in, in your translation and the way that you talk about Beowulf, making this case that is, seems totally true to me. Yeah, you know, and like, it's so clear how those tropes have, have animated our society. Even if you look at movies, I mean, every mm -hmm. Marvel movie and Star Wars, it's the same sort of deal, right? Um, and so anyway, I, I just, I love that point and I, and I can't, I think it can't be emphasized enough. Um, speaking of shit talking, which is a segue I've always wanted to make, I wonder if I could ask you to read from one of my favorite sections um, in your translation where Beowulf responds to a challenge and does some of this boasting that we're talking about. Yes, let me, okay, here we go. This is a section that is, um, Beowulf has arrived at Hurat Hall. He's, a, he's like a newcomer. No one really knows what his cred is and he needs to prove it. And within Hrothgar's court, he finds a guy named Unferth who is the right hand to the king. And Unferth is like, no, 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 no. You're not going to come in here and be a hero. I'm already here. Meanwhile though, Unferth has not actually killed Grendel and he's been there for 12 years failing to kill Grendel. So Beowulf has a problem. Unferth has a problem with Beowulf, Beowulf has a problem with Unferth, and it turns into this kind of bro battle, which I emphasized in this translation. Near Hrothgar's feet squatted Unferth, Eglaf's son, unconvinced, whispering churlish words. Beowulf's bravado bristled him and envy ate him alive. He'd historically been glorious, and the notion that another more notorious under heaven might enjoy greater greatness made him gnash. Bro, do you happen to be the Beowulf who challenged Brecca in the open ocean, insisting you should swim in shark seas for no reason but to prove your petty prowess, boasting that no boat should guard your lives but that you should risk them recklessly? 
I heard no one could convince you two of clarity, that you dove overboard surfing on stupidity, swearing you knew the currents better than any other, and that you, swole as a troll fed on travelers, were superior to any swell. You lulled for seven nights in wintry waters, and in the end, he outswam your fool self, skipped ashore unscathed, though uncertain, and rolled onto land safely in the land of the Hevel Reims. From there, he went to his home country, where the Brandings adored him, a calm and pleasant place, and returned to his hall, his host. His boyish boast was proven that, yes, he'd bested Beowulf. No matter your other battles, the tales you told, the lines you sold, buddy, at least you lived. This time, bro, know it. No one's ever lasted a night clasped in Grendel's arms. Beowulf, edge thou son, wasn't phased. Well, actually, buddy, sit down, you're drunk. Unforth, you've run your mouth about Brecca, me and our sea swagger, but let me drop some truth into your tangent. I've been better on the water, deeper in the drink, and stronger in the swim than any man alive. Brecca and I were boys together. Our desires were only dares, one upon the other, brother to brother. Maybe you know this story? But hold up, I forgot. You've got no brothers left. We declared ourselves adventurers, and so we swam, swords in hands for safety, unsheathed, father forged. We knew there were sharks. No one here is stupid. He couldn't float freer or swim straighter than I, and I had no urge to leave him or lose the lesser swimmer. I was Brecca's lifeguard. I knew my duty. The rains rocked us and storms shook us, and for five nights we floated, warring against winds from the north, the waves like blades bone cold, until at last we were blown apart, the biting beasts of the bottom ro roiling up to ring me, wrestling me to the seafloor. All that held me was my armor, clasped hands made of gold, chain mail, gainsaying waves and wet, the work of ancestors forging my ferocity. It kept me bold enough to fight when a monster dragged me down and gripped me, ripping at my skin. I was pinned, swaddling, swaddled in squalor. Last chance, I took it. I put that monster down. I made it a sleeper as it leapt, severed its spine, spiked its skull, and split it into smithereens. My own strength sank that sea monster, and soon I was fighting again, lower than any human sight outside even the edges of God's light. Dark deeps hell's creatures in them, swinging my sword beneath the eyes of the world. I would not be eaten nor beaten, no skewered swimmer I, no drowned dinner for a circle of cold companions gobbling my guts, glutted on my gold. At dawn, I surfaced in a slurry of scales, floating flotsam where formerly there'd been fangs. I'd sacrificed myself to save every subsequent seafarer from deep despair, and the monsters of the dark were gone. The east was gilded with God and the sea was smooth. I could see the shore, the strong cliffs rising, built of their own bruises. If a man's brave enough, Fate, when on the fence, will often spare him. I'd never brag, but the truth is my sword slew nine singular scavengers that night. There are no ocean-goring stories more awful than mine, no tales of greater terror, no other man so sea-stalked. But I survived. My salvation in my own hands. The waves bore me shoreward, attending me, and left me, at long last, in the land of the Finns. The end. I've racked my brain, bro, but Unforth, I can't unpack any similar stories of heroics from you. Let me say it straight. You don't rage, and neither did Brecca when it came to battle. The gulf? You're cattle, and I'm a wolf. I'm not even mentioning your sins, your kin killing, your brother beating. I'm not the man to damn you. No shit though, Unferth, if you were the bitter brawling brave you claim to be, your king wouldn't have suffered a single night of Grendel's rampage. No bitten bones, no hall horror, no chaos in his kingdom. Grendel was aware he had nothing to fear here. Your sword's soft, son. No warrior awaited him in Hurit. The shieldings were unshielded, their hall unguarded. He knew he could crush you, comfort himself with grappling, grind your bones to make his bread. 
He's got no fear of Beer Hall brothers, but this you can quote, he'll fear me. There are no guns of note on anyone but me and my gants. Come on, Eglef son, beat me. Or better yet, make me a bet that Grendel's maker won't be met. Then if you brave boys feel like drinking, I'll serve you ale for breakfast. The sun shining on silver and gold, daylight yours after night's been mine. Ah, so good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so that's soft, that's the God. nature of the original. <laughs> Uh, he does a Trumpian thing where he's like, well, I'm not going to say that you did all these bad things, but I, I am actually, but no, I'm not going to, I wouldn't be a guy who would say that. I would so, never, I, I would like never. Trump rally. <laughs> <laughs> it does. He, I mean, and to be fair, this was, was of course inspired by the rhetoric that we've been listening to for the last four years, if you're like most Americans, but if you were a New Yorker, you were listening to this long before that. And if you were seeing him on TV, you were listening to it as well. You know, I remember um, Ruth Franklin in The New Yorker, I think, compared this trash talking to Omar Little um, in The Wire, um, which I'm also in the middle of watching oh, right now. And so that, that comparison was so apt. I was like, you know, um, Beowulf all but whistles farmer in the dell as he appears on the scene. Beowulf's coming, Beowulf's coming. <laughs> um, and I was really struck by the line, he'd historically been glorious and the notion that another more notorious under heaven might enjoy greater greatness made him gnash. And so Unforth there seems like totally Trumpian as well. You know, I was kind of thinking of, I was sort of wondering, you know, who is the best um, sparring partner for Trump on Twitter? And I think maybe I would nominate George Conway or, or maybe Walter Schaub, those, those guys trading, treats with him, trading tweets with him. And then Beowulf seeks to declare himself by announcing his own prowess. And, when you thought about bringing that kind of um, myth-making within the longer myth of the poem to life in modern English, what rhetorical qualities did you want to bring out? I mean, I, I really wanted to, there are so many different things in this poem in terms of the way men talk about themselves and in terms of the way the narrator talks about the men who are talking about themselves. So I was working on bringing out in this section, especially the, the sort of self mythologizing of people like Trump or just really any guy who wants to win. He, he makes the case that he has already won before he wins. So he's like, of course I would win. God chose me, I'm the man. Like, I don't, I don't know what you would be thinking to even try to fight against me. Don't try, don't try it. And I was working on using that kind of, um, that kind of con persuasion rhetoric, I guess is what it would be. And it's, it's like, you know, gigantic myth-making and persuasion. And throughout the poem, guys have second thoughts. Like there are several sequences where sometimes a bard will just break in and sing a little bad song and it is in a moment of celebration, but the bard is like, here's a terrible thing that happened once to a guy like you, but sings it like it's flattering. And other translators have sometimes been like, whatever, that got stuffed in by another, another person. There was a gap in the page count. I don't know, they had to stick something in there. But I think they're all really related. It's like there, there's constant commentary that if you continue to shake your dick, it is eventually gonna fall off. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's the point often of the bards. The bards are like, it's going to go badly. It's going to go badly. It's going to go badly. And then four pages later, it does go badly. And you see catastrophic events um, created by, by bragging beyond your, your actual capacity. Um, so it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I think that there's just a whole bunch of, I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm the man, which is why I did it as, as the bro version of this. But, uh, but I'm the man is, is a longstanding kind of phrase that, that people have used. Even, even as a woman, there's a, Brothgar's wife at one point thinks about Beowulf and she's, he's bragging, he's bragging, he's bragging and she's convinced. She's like, well, I guess he has brass balls, if nothing else. He may not have anything <laughs> else, but he has brass balls. And you know, even as a woman, when people say you have balls, it means you're the man, which is, um, really questionable, but a long tradition of the questionable phrasing and the questionable gendered um, inflation. I mean, it's also true that trash talking can be fun if you're playing gin rummy with your grandmother. Mm -hmm. I used to trash talk my grandmother and she would trash talk me when we played gin rummy. You know, it's like, I, there's no way you're going to win this. You know, you're going to lose, right? I mean, that that part is, there's a part of that that's human and fun and that, and that mm -hmm. we all sort of enjoy, I think. 
It's just when it becomes your president who feels the need to do it with everyone, it becomes a little tiresome. Yeah, it's funny because in, in our normal daily lives, we kind of know that trash talking is bullshit. We know yeah. that it's, we and it's funny, it's comedic. But yeah, when it's the president doing that kind of trash talking all day long, the president and and more people than that, Mitch McConnell does it all the time too. And he doesn't uh, know it's funny he, or he doesn't, you know, like when we did it, we were laughing at ourselves at the same time. It's about delivery and tone, I think. Yeah, he has no sense of humor about himself. Whereas I think, at least in this text, um, not that Beowulf necessarily has a sense of humor about himself, <laughs> but the narrator has a sense of humor about Beowulf. So right. it's, uh, so there's a, a layer of perspective, but I think there's a sort of, society, we've kind of lost that layer, which is a weird thing. The layer of like excessive, flamboyant, performative braggadocio has now, now seems like normal behavior. There's this kind of like interesting conservative prudery about time. Like, mm -hmm. you know, oh, that time is back there and it's precious. And like, we mustn't muck up how it's portrayed, you know, and you know, like we can't possibly take 1776 and then refer to 1619. Um, you know, we can't, um, you know, we can't talk about the Civil War in, in this way and then also talk about it in that way. We can't um, think about how history affects other history. And even just on a very syntactical level, I think that the translation does such a nice job of like really exploding that. Um, and so it has this real, um, like an energy to the rhythms and to the prose that um, makes it feel propulsive. Um, I think in the introduction, you say you want it to be meaty and juicy, uh, which I also really liked. Um, but yeah, I just think like that, that prudery about time, like it makes me think of like, you know, I don't know, the Confederate war monuments um, that people have been protecting um, or arguing about the ways that Trump has tried to push um, has tried to push like the way that people like the executive order, for example, on how we can talk about um, race, uh, you know, like, oh, there can't yeah. be any scapegoats, right? The sort of um, like, you mustn't touch the history. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing, I read that executive order too. And I was like, <laughs> I'm sorry. There is much that hasn't been documented, but there's plenty that has been documented that we can really talk about. It's part of the history. And not only is it part of the history, but it it, it sort of impacts the way that we understand the discomfort and bonkersness of America right now. Like if we redact that information, if we say we never did anything wrong, we end up going, why is the dragon coming for me? What What is happening? Why is this dragon so mad? And, um, you know, I mean, that's a bad position to be in. If you end up wondering why there is anger, if you think there shouldn't be anger because you're just good, your whole history is a history of good because your history has been redacted and removed from your understanding of the life you've been living and the privileges that, that have been stolen from other people so that you could live that life. It, it results in a confused and bewildered and angry but useless society. I just... It's a, it's such a thing. I, I think about the way people have talked a little bit in this, uh, about this translation saying, this will not stand the test of time. <laughs> it has, the words in it are too modern and we, and they're not going to, and I'm like, come on. Like the words in the English language are evolving all the time. Slang evolves daily. And it's, um, and I don't, I don't really care if it stands the test of time. Like my goal is not like, I must have this legacy and it must live on after me. I'm using a text that's, the person who wrote it is dead, really dead, so dead. And I have translated it into a book that, that we can look at right now and think about. But if in a hundred years, this book is like a crazy artifact, whatever, that's fine. I hope that it does some work right now. That's the goal. The goal is not for it to in a thousand years be the only one that people look at. I don't want to be the only translator that people look at. I want there to be translators who are far more diverse than I am because I think there are perspectives that I didn't look at in this text and there are perspectives in terms of anchoring it to the events of our society that I couldn't see from where I'm standing. So open the doors, kick this fucking doors down and get new translations after this one that are that have perspectives that I don't have. I mean, that's the glory of a text that lives a long time and that potentially lives, you know, a text that has survived and survived and survived can withstand and, and continue to be interesting, um, no matter what anybody does to it.
which is the glory, the like unpressure and all the pressure kind of thing about doing a translation of Beowulf is that people are going to look at it, but whatever, somebody else is going to translate it next year. Well, Maria, thank you so much for joining us with this translation in this year. <laughs> thank you. It's great to have you with us. And we encourage our listeners to pick up a copy of the translation and also to read The Mere Wife and Maria's other books.